Oh, it's that time again. Time to critique your renders. So it's been about a month since the last one of these videos. And uh, I think we received about a hundred um, artworks that people sent in. So I've picked out seven, which I think might be interesting. And we're gonna be critiquing them, ripping them apart, crushing their dreams um, in order to grow. Because that's how you grow. You have your dreams shattered. Um, but no, honestly, critique is one of the most important things to improve as an artist. In fact, it's, it's almost like a shortcut. If you wanted to improve really, really quickly, getting critiques can be uh, really beneficial because it's a fresh pair of eyes and um, you can learn things that would have normally taken you months to figure out by yourself, but you can learn it in, in seconds. So uh, that's, that's the aim anyway. And also at the end of the video, I'm gonna be critiquing one of my own renders to show you that I'm not a total dick. I, I can see the faults in my own renders as well. So uh, that's what we're gonna do. First image comes from Alexandra LeBlanc, who said, cartoon styled flash character in 3D I made. Um, Awesome. I, I picked this one because it's actually really good. Like from a technical standpoint, you look at it and you go, that's a good character render. Like it's a simple, you know, smooth, uh, stylized character, obviously with simple lighting. It stands out from the background. You haven't got conflicting color schemes or anything. It's well lit. You can see everything like, yeah, it's a, it's a really nice looking character. Um, but but there are a few things that I thought could be done to improve it, which is obviously the whole point of this. So let's talk about it. The first one is the, uh, the anatomy of the character. So this is something like anatomy, is something that I didn't realize was so important until I started learning uh, 2D drawing. And then, then I, I noticed that every time a pro artist was critiquing somebody else's work, it was never to do with like the technicalities of it, like the colors or the, the shapes or whatever. It was all to do with the gesture and the anatomy of that character. So I did a little facial anatomy course online. So I learned a couple of things. Um, so for example, this, this bulging shape that you've got coming out of the middle part of the forehead, um, like the bit where a unibrow would grow, whatever that part is called, that is bulging outwards like that, right? It's bulging like that. But that would only happen if the eyebrows were frowning deeply like that, like forced down, and then it would actually force the skin outwards, right? It would go to a like sort of pop outwards. The only time, yeah, you, you would see that is, is if you've got that expression. But your character has a very relaxed state, if not actually surprised state, like these eyebrows look pretty raised up actually. So you would actually see the opposite of that. You would see it sort of concave instead of convex, if those are the correct terms. Um, assuming also that that's not the design of the Flash character. Like I think I, I think he doesn't have a diamond in the front of his forehead. I did a quick Google search and I don't think that was part of his costume. So that's my critique on that part. Now, the rest of it has to do with, um, yeah, the, the other two main elements are the eyes and the jaw of the character. So the eyes, if you go in here, they look really big, right? They're very, very big eyes. Um, now that's not unusual, especially for a cartoon styled character, um, especially anime, you know, you'll notice that they really ham it up with the, with the big eyes. But one thing to note about big eyes is that it's generally associated with cuteness um, and therefore mostly used on girls. So these are a few renders that I pulled off ArtStation with their respective artists there. But you can see that it's used mostly for girls because the large eyes looks cute. And the reason for that is that the, um, the size of the head in, rel in, the, in relation to the eyes, or maybe it's the other way around, <laughs> yeah. But basically the greater the ratio, um, the cuter the thing looks. So on the really the ultimate far end of the spectrum, the most cute thing is a kitten because a kitten has a really small head and really giant eyes. So that's why a kitten is so cute. So. 
That said, we normally, for female characters, we make the eyes look big. You can use them on male characters, like his one here. You've got some sort of slightly big eyes when he's got his like wide-eyed expression, but generally, um, and that image was from Jin Kim as well, uh, but generally men have this sort of frowning sort of tiny eye slits poking through basically like these you can see here um, and the eyebrows are really big and overwhelming giant eyes that are really adding expression sorry eyebrows that are adding expression to the eyes um, again there's always exceptions to the other case like there was a character from big hero 6 who had like big sort of wider looking eyes but that was the older brother who was a very um, approachable amicable likable character so that sort of plays into his his style there so in your case here you've got what should be a very masculine strong built character and possibly even intimidating i don't know um, but the eyes here they look way too friendly um, and they also don't have a lot of emotion going on it's just the eyes are raised up sort of like he's surprised about something he's like mm, how about that what's going on you know um which i i think you could do more with it than that um, so yeah, have a go at that. The other thing, I think you've got a wrinkle going on up here where there shouldn't be a wrinkle. There's not really a wrinkle between, like if, if there, there's a wrinkle where the, the lid folds down, like that lid up there, but it's, it's a lot closer than that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's another thing there. There is a course I would recommend, by the way, if you're interested before I forget, proco.com, um, is a guy I actually interviewed for the podcast, um, ages ago. Uh, but yeah, he, he makes some really great videos. I've watched a bunch of his. He's got free ones on YouTube. This is from his anatomy course where he did a whole study on the, the human body. So you could check that out if you're interested. If you really want to take your characters to the next level. Um, and the other problem, uh, other than the eyes, is the jaw. So you've got what looks like a very thin and slim uh, jawline, right? Where it sort of goes down like that. It's very pointy. Um, and that's usually done, again, for female characters because, for whatever reason, the thinner the, the jaw, like the, the thinner the, the, the face looks, the more feminine it looks. It's also why, um, if you've ever taken a photo of Korean girls, with their permission, um, but if you've ever done that, you'll notice that they all immediately go like this. I learned this while I was over there. The reason they do that is to hide their jaw and to try and make their face look thinner than it actually is. They all go like that to make their face look thinner. Um, so, yeah, female characters have a very pointy chin. So in your case, I think it's too pointy. I think it's a little bit too out there. So I would um, increase the width of it, sort of drag it out to maybe here, and I'd also maybe... Uh, also, at the back of it, like where that, that sharp edge is, on male characters, it's very, very sharp. Like the sharper it is, the more masculine it's going to look. And on really masculine characters, you get like a little bulge down there as well. So that's something you could do. Again, I'm only saying this because I, the rest of the character looks very friendly and approachable, uh, but you've got this big, giant muscle coming out the back there. So that sort of tells me that you wanted to go for a masculine um, superhero look. So if you've got big strong muscles you got to make sure everything else matches it you got to have the wide jaw boxed corner there you've got to i'd probably also increase this the um the area <laughs> the shape of the nose uh by sort of uh having this maybe come out to there um something like that sort of make it a larger looking nose um, also the lips are a little bit thin as well, um, but mostly to do with the, uh, with the shapes there. I also made a couple of, uh, I just used the Photoshop liquify thing to sort of smooth out some of those areas, but I just made the jaw wider so you can see how it would look. And I also made the eyes smaller just as a comparison. So you can see how it totally changes the look of the character there. Um, yeah. Okay. So that was basically it for the shape of it. The other problems... The only other ones I would mention is that the light at the top of the head there, um, you've got light that sort of goes uh, like, you've got a, a rim light from there and you've got a key light sort of going across here, right? But you've got this patch here where there isn't anything. So I would just add another light over here to shine on that patch so that you've actually got something in that area. Um, and the other thing to note, again, this is just a minor thing. Um, but the lighting coming from this side, coming from there and then going across, 
Uh, that is, I can't remember the exact name for it, but it's, it's used when you're photographing girls, again, because it makes the face look thinner. If you had the light facing almost the same direction as the camera, like the broad side, which would be this side of the face, um, it makes the face look broader, right? It makes it look like it's filled out more. So that's something to note. But again, as well, like it, there's always exceptions to the rules. Um, this style lighting coming from here, like you've done, can also be used for mystery, like to just outline the character's features like that. Um, that can be used for mystery. But just understand the pros and cons. Um, I've got a video on character lighting if you want to check it out. Link is in the description. Um, let me check my notes, make sure I haven't missed anything because there's a lot of stuff. Oh, the other just minor thing here, yeah, before I forget, is you've got a little light right there in the bottom of the eye, which to me just feels... Oh, come on, I'm trying to... I want the eyedropper tool, dang it. Daggummit. Where's my eyedropper tool? There it is. I want to take that. <laughs> Gosh. <sighs> There we go. Now I've got my eyedropper tool. What was up with that? I couldn't change to it. I would get rid of that, that catch light there because it doesn't look as though there is a light from this direction. You've obviously got a fill light or something over here, which is where it's picking that up. But I, you should clean that up because it shouldn't really appear there unless the viewer is, is noticing it a lot. Um, in fact, you could also, now that I mention it, um, maybe put the catch light over here. Like just sort of increase this one right there. Because catch lights help the character look alive. So you can exaggerate it sometimes if you want. But that's it. That's the advice that I would give you, uh, Alexandra. And thank you for sending it in. All right, next. This image comes from a Uditya Afandi. <laughs> Sorry if I say your name wrong. I know I am. Really liked your blended art critique. I learned so much from other people's mistakes. Cool. That's that's my my hope for these videos. Um, I really need some feedback before I put this in my portfolio. Oh, it's a portfolio piece. That means we get to be extra critical. Uh, no, <laughs> it's actually, it's a really nice piece. I think I even shared it on the Blender Guru Facebook, on Twitter, um, whenever I saw it, I was like, yeah, this is a really nice character. Um, most realistic characters, like when you're going for this level of realism, they tend to look really terrible because there's so many things that can go wrong and you've got a lot less breathing room than you do with a cartoon style character because you can enter in the uncanny valley and all sorts of problems. But yours is definitely one of the better ones. Um, that said, this is a critique episode, so let's talk about things that could be improved. So in your case, very similar to the last uh, Alexandra's image, the main problems that I have with this have to do with... Well, yeah. Well, actually, the main problem is the skin texture. But first up, let's talk about the uh, the anatomy. So you've got, on this female character, you've got what looks like pursed lips. You've got her lips sort of going like, like that, like duck face, right? You know what all the girls do in photos? Like that. And the reason it looks like that might not even be the, the, the fault of the model. It could be the lighting. Um, because you've got some really harsh shadows under here. And it like stretches all the way around, which tells me that that part of the body is really protruding from the fish, you know? You can see in my in my video, right? So you don't want to have that much of a, uh, of a shadow underneath there. So I would just eliminate that. You could even Photoshop it out if you wanted to. Um, the other one is you've got like in the corners of the mouth, you've got this slight shadow in there. And that really, you only see that shadow when I can't remember the name of the muscle, but there's a muscle group which will pull back the corners of the mouth like a curtain. It'll go like uh, like that. So when that's engaged, it, it tells you that the that it's a smile, like it's a small smile. Um, however, the rest of the face tells me that she's in a relaxed state, like the face is just mm, like that. But then you've got those little, the cheek corners sort of going like, mm. so it's like, it, it doesn't quite match the eyes or the rest of the face. At least in my opinion, I would I would just reduce it a little bit, just cut it back. It's not too obvious, but it's it's there. Um, and the other thing, I think probably I can't remember the name of this bone, but I think that this should be a little bit further up, like that little divot that you've got there. I think it should be a little bit higher up, and I think there would be a little bit more of a bulge there. Eh, I don't know. I'm just trying to imagine the skull underneath it, um, but 
it's not too bad, honestly. That, that That's quite all right. The biggest one, though, is down here. You've got some jowls. So you've got this this chin there, and then you've got the, the rounded edge of the cheek there, but then you've got this sort of like bulging roundness underneath there. So we generally only see that on old people because there are, yeah, what you call the jowls. When someone says, I got jowls, they're talking about like this. Like if you pull that down, like right there, it's sort of at the corners of your mouth, you pull that down. Um, you see that. So on a young character like she is, um, you wouldn't see that jowling fat. So yeah, that's that's the critiques on the anatomy. The biggest glaring problem that I noticed the first time I opened this though was the skin texture or the materials. It seems as though like if I was to reach through this image and touch her face and then come back, like my fingers would be greasy. <laughs> and I say that because she looks just wet, just soaking, like someone sprayed her face with canola oil or something. Uh, just so greasy. Um, obviously, his skin can be moist, um, and it should be in, in certain parts, especially around the eyes, but you wouldn't see it like on the, the nose like you've got here, right? Like it's way too much. This, yeah, it's just shiny. Like look how much shininess is in there, right? Uh, you could almost see a reflection if you came too close. So definitely cut back on that. It should be a lot duller, uh, a sort of diffused sort of look. And the other thing is the, the texture of the skin. Um, I think the texture is probably too low res, which is why some of this bump here on the nose, like some of these bumps look enormous, like almost like a, like a, I was thinking like the, an octopus's arms, those little suction cups, right? Like you can see these like individual bulbs, uh, bulbous shapes coming off the skin there. So it's a little bit too low res. I think maybe you've gone procedural perhaps, but I think you should use some real skin textures. Um, I haven't used it myself, but I know texturing XYZ has some good skin textures um, because I think they're photo scanned or whatever, but you could check them out. Um, yeah, and I think the other, the only other problem is, much like I mentioned for Alexandra, to do with the catch light. So it could really benefit from having a small reflection right in the eye there, like that. Um, because catch lights are what signifies that the person is alive. <laughs> so I think it's because if you see a dead body, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the eyes are, are, are dry, right? So there's no reflection in the eyes, which means that if you don't see a catch light in your character's eyes, same when you're photographing a person, they can look dead without realizing. You've got a catch light over here, which I think shouldn't be there because this is the side with the shadows and then this is the side with the light. So you wanna make sure that it uh, that it matches that, obviously. So I would remove that one and instead I would just add one here because this is where the key light is coming from. Um, yeah, this is an image that I think it's the best example. I think it's the most realistic character that I've seen created with 3D. Um, it's a fantastic image and you can see those problems are pretty well fixed. Like they've got a lot stronger um, anatomy. They don't have any jowling problems. This, there's no, none of that deep shadow underneath the lip. You know, again, uh, comparing it uh, to yours, there's, yeah, a lot more of a shadow underneath there. Um, and the skin looks a lot more diffused. A little bit of reflection around the eyes, but not too much. And obviously they've got a much higher res texture there um, than what you've got. So. Those are a few things. Um, you did mention it's for a portfolio, so I do want to, uh, you know, talk about some ways it could be, could be improved. And obviously, this is a BG critique, so that's what it is. Um, yeah, I, I think it, I think it is really fantastic, though. You did, yeah. The hair, especially, I really love the hair. That's the strongest element by far. Looking at this, so that looks amazing. Maybe a little bit too frizzy, but it is quite cool. So you've done a great job. We could talk about the neck. I think something to do with the neck muscles down there. Look, they should maybe be narrower, perhaps. How narrow are mine? I don't even know. I didn't I didn't study like the rest of the body's muscles, but I, all I know is the face. But something about that looks odd. That's it. Thank you for sending that through. Next image. This one comes from a Daniel Mayer Martinez, who says, I would like to participate in your next Blender Art Critique video. Thank you and greetings from Mexico. Well, greetings. Um, nice image. Yeah, really, really good. One thing I, I do like is how 
lived in the scene feels like it takes so long to model things for architectural interiors that most people just go with the minimalistic style like bare countertops bare desks bare everything but yours is crazy there's all sorts of modeling going on so yeah really well done making it look lived in however i think it uh it's a little bit too confusing because um you've got you got too much going on here you got just stuff everywhere and the eye doesn't really know where to look when you look at this you're sort of drawn to this area because there's some harsh brightness there which we'll talk about but it's overall there's just too much you've got so much going on over here so much going on over here there's barely um an empty space in the whole scene so i think and it's one of the mistakes um that i talked about in the architecture academy is a lot of people make is they, they choose really wide frames. They try to photograph an entire room, um, whereas the best architectural interior photos are sort of more zoomed in. So that is to say, I think we could just crop out all of that, <laughs> right? And automatically it feels a little bit, there we go, something like that. Like your eye now has a clear direction to go. We're just looking at the desk over here. We're not being distracted by a, a separate lounge setting over on the right there. So I think that could improve it a lot. Um, but, you know, if you were to keep it, I'd at least get rid of this bush. It looks like it's got motion blur or something, like the, the bush is flying into the frame, uh, which is a little bit like, oh, it's a bit intimidating <laughs> just sitting right there in our, in our peripheral vision. Um, if you were to keep it again, I, I would try and minimize its impact, like its visual weight, maybe making that rug white instead of blue, that one there as well. Um, clean off some of this stuff and it could look a little bit nicer, but uh, it's just, yeah, there's way too much going on um, to focus on. Probably too many plants as well. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten plants. And then not, not including the stuff outside. That's a lot. Um, you can definitely have it. I don't think the plants should be up there on the window, so I think they would probably die unless they were plastic. But um, yeah, that, it's a very nature-driven scene, which normally I think is a great thing for architecture, and it can be done well, but it doesn't really fit this sort of office space environment. So that's the critiques on that. Uh, let me pull up my notes, make sure I'm not missing too much. Um, th the scene also feels too yellow. Like you got really orange lighting coming through here, which is fine, but there should also be in the shadowy mid-tone areas. It should be a little bit bluer. So, I mean, I could just try a little quick fix here. Let's see. want to add... We want to cut back on the red values. So we'll just turn that back just a little bit. Maybe in the shadows like that. And then I just increase the blue ever so slightly in the shadows. Oh gosh, the Wacom tablet with its little annoying circle that keeps popping up. I gotta turn it off. Um, yeah, you can see that that does make the scene feel a little bit calmer, right? Like it's the, here, it's like, there's almost like a fire going on outside. It's too bright. So you, uh, yeah, just wanna make sure that you sort of balance it as best you can. Um, the other thing is the exposure, like the sunlight that's coming through is really, really bright. Um, I would suspect, I don't know obviously, but I suspect that you're not using Filmic Blender. So check out my video on Filmic Blender. You can see the link for that in the description. The Filmic Blender video will explain to you how exposure works with cameras and how you can better set up your camera in Blender to reflect that. But basically, in a nutshell, you shouldn't see this high peaking white values there and there or there like that's it's really too much it's yeah in relation to the rest of the scene so dial that back with filmic blender you won't see that so yeah just watch that video um the reflections and like the wood i really like the wood material but i think it's too small you can have those smaller slits of wood obviously i've seen them that size before but i think the detail in them is too, there's too much detail for that type of wood. I think that this type of wood is at least double that size that you've got going on there in, in regards to the scale. Um, but yeah, there wasn't too many other things to mention. The wallpaper's a little bit confusing. You got this sort of jaggedy pattern, which is all right on this section here, but in the background here, it's hard to tell if it's wallpaper or if it's supposed to look like that stucco material. So I would just make that wall clean white there. I'm guessing this is probably your room, your office, which is why 
you've got on your own <laughs> on your own scene uh, on your own computers there you've got uh, this scene that you're working on right so I'm guessing that's why you've, you've uh, set up everything the way it is because that's how your real house is but from a completely visual artistic standpoint those are the fixes all right next image this one is from a Matthias Garret Silva who said I wanted to submit my image of the fox and the crow. I want to illustrate my favorite childhood fables and riddles in a low poly style. You could really use a critique. Okay, um, great. Thank you for sending it through. So low poly, huh? Everybody's doing low poly these days. Um, I get low poly. It's obviously a very approachable style, especially if you're a beginner, um, but it also allows you to make wider scenes without spending you know, hours on each individual model. So I, I get it. I'm personally not a star, not a fan of the style usually um, because yeah, it, it can feel like it's just like a, a worse done realistic scene. I'm not saying that for yours, but that's generally the case. It's like they've put less detail into everything as a style. Um, so I think you've really got to focus on what makes a style look like at that style. What makes it, what, what are the good things about it? So here's an image that I got um, off ArtStation that I really liked. It's a low poly style. It's a sort of a macro thing, but they've got some reflections on, on everything. They've got like heavy depth of field. So it looks like a miniature set. Again, this is a different style to yours, but you know. Um, so it, 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 just have a look at some styles that, that show you how it can be done well. This is some Firewatch art from the game Firewatch, which is a very stylized game as well. Um, but yeah, so in having a a look at, at what you can see of low poly art that's done well. What this scene suffers from, I think, is um, for one, that texture, that paper texture. Oh, I really hate that thing popping up whenever my finger touches it. That paper texture is really, really too intense. Like this ruffled up paper that you've got going on over the entire background. It's just too much. Um, it's really, really over the top. So I would dial that back a lot. Um, just have it as a very subtle thing because at the moment it's just overpowering the whole image. Um, the next up I would talk about is the lighting. So there's a slight shadow. I can see you've got a slight shadow going on there, but generally you don't have any shadows in your scene, which I think especially for a low poly scene is a big mistake because you've already, you're already lacking detail. So you want to try and build in real detail, like, you know, lighting detail as, as best you can. But in your case, it looks like it's just flatly lit from the sky above it. it doesn't have a sunlight or anything else so that's another one i'd mention um, and the other one is that you can use detail to guide the viewer to what is important and i think you've got way too much going on of this grass which seems to have been uniformly distributed over the entire scene all the way in the backgrounds as well um, so i think i think you should only put it in like a few like around the tree for example maybe a little bit over here some down here or something like that, maybe one or two in the background. I don't know. Just experiment with it, but I don't think you should have it everywhere because it's just in. It's too confusing to uh, to look at. Um, I think the depth of field with that paper effect doesn't make a lot of sense. Like that heavy depth of field in the background. I don't know. Um, just looks odd with that paper effect. The paper cutout effect I think is supposed to look like a flat two D looking image. Like you've got paper cutouts in front of each other. So I don't think you would see that depth of field there if you've got that. Um, yeah, and then the bird itself. So the bird has some tangent problems. It's got this little yellow thing in its beak, which I can see, but it's almost matching up with the body of the bird. And so therefore, when your eye first sees it, it's not clear that he's got something in his beak or if it's something that's behind the bird, like a sun, for example. So I would just, just rotate his head in that direction a little bit. Um, so he's holding out the uh, the seed right there like that so that way it's a lot easier to read the image um, but there you go so that's my uh, that's my advice there Matthias um, yeah it's a really um, it could be a really nice scene and I like the idea of making um, a scene from your childhood um, but yeah just just basically I like to just go online and just have a look and maybe you don't like these styles but find something that you do like and then just assess it from a student perspective what is it that makes that scene look great and how can I put that into the image? So that would be my advice for you. Next image. This one comes from an Emas Harahap. And you've said, 
Can I you get some feedback or suggestions for improving? Awesome. Yeah, I picked this one because you've got a story in it, and I think there's uh, there's a few tips that other people could could pick up from this as well. So we could go you know deep, and we could talk about some things like all oh, this depth of field, this glare, or these sparks or whatever, it doesn't make sense. Or we could talk about the texturing on the, the carts. But I think not really any of that matters until you fix the biggest problem, which is the composition of this image. So when I first opened it, I didn't even notice that there was a dude hanging himself down there, right? Pretty depressing, by the way. <laughs> but I didn't even notice it because your eye is drawn up to about here or somewhere over here looking at the detail of that that Ferris wheel. I didn't notice that there was a black thing, guy hanging off the bottom there, um, until I went looking for it. Um, so yeah, have a look at my compositional video, which is a link for that is in the YouTube description. But it talks about like how important it is to have a focal element and how you bring attention to that focal element. Uh, one of the ways is with contrast, which obviously you've got, but also the placement of it. So being this far down the image, like right here, like it's not that far off from the bottom of the image, right? So your eye is naturally sort of gonna gravitate towards the center of the image. So what I would do if I were you, and I'm actually just gonna do this right now as a, I hope this works, but let's, let's see how it goes. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to do a quick fix. I don't know how well this will work, especially while we're recording. I haven't actually done this yet. Let's see how we go. I'm gonna hit shift, shift F5. Okay, yeah, not bad. Could be better, but that'll do. And then I'm gonna pick up this guy. Yeah, oh, come on. I just selected it. Try it again. Uh, uh, there we go. And then I'm gonna move him up and I'm gonna put him here instead. All right, excellent. Now, wait, where did I put him? You gotta be on a new layer. Oh, come on. All right, new layer, paste. Now we move him up. What are you doing? I swear, Photoshop is changing stuff. Oh, boy. All right, forget it. I'll just slap it up there then. Apparently, I can't take it off that layer. All right. Yeah, why is Photoshop changing everything around? I blame Photoshop, all right? Okay, let me just quickly fix this. Get rid of him there. Oh, whew. It's getting into be one of those days. So essentially all I'm trying to do is move him up and just to see how it looks when you do that. Um, all right, I won't try and fix up that, but you get the idea. So if he was hanging from there, like looking at it from over here, you could see that it's, it's a lot easier to read um, when you've got that, right? as opposed to it being where it was before. It's just, yeah, it's just easier to read it right there. So that is be, what would be what I would do. I wouldn't, I would get rid of like half of the carriages. So remove that carriage, maybe that one down there and just have that much gap between them. And then that person hanging, hanging himself, you really want to nail in the depression. You want to make sure that he's in a place where people can look. And I would also actually get rid of these birds up here because I think they are a little bit too distracting. So, Something like that. And that way it's very, very clear that he's right there. I think also he's a little bit simple in uh, in shape and whatever. So what I would do if I were you is I would give him just a little bit of light. Just on the edges of the rim there. Maybe a different color, obviously, like yellow or something to match the sunlight. But that would just make him look a little bit more detailed than he currently is, which is solid black. To me, it doesn't make a lot of sense that you would have a solid black character there. But anyways, so you can see the difference between them. When he's down there, you don't really notice him. And when he's up there, he's a lot more noticeable. Obviously, do a lot better job than I've done there trying to crop it out. But that's the general gist of it. The other one is the depth of field. So I think unless this is a miniature sized scene, which I don't think it is, you wouldn't have this much depth of field. Like if I was to stand underneath the first wheel and take a photo, I don't know what setting I'd have to be on in order to see this guy perfectly clear, but for the rest of the Ferris wheel to be completely out of focus. That just wouldn't really happen in real life unless it was a miniature set. So you wanna make sure that you've got, yeah, a, less, a deeper depth of field, not shallow, right? So 
yeah, that would be my tips for improving it. But thank you for sending it through, Emas. Next image. This one comes from A. Sridhari Sridha, who says, it's a whizzing car going through a hairpin turn. Okay, yeah, BG critique. You want critique. All right. So thank you for sending it in, Sridhari. Um, very ambitious scene, I must say. Having a car going through water, there's a lot that can go wrong. And um, it, it's a very challenging scene, is, is all I want to say. So before I, you know, smash it or whatever, if I roast it, just know that I, I do appreciate how much work went into this. Um, okay, so the biggest problems, first of all, the, the biggest problem I have to address is these droplets here, right? Um, why is my tool that color? Let's change that. So with these droplets, they wouldn't be crisp. They shouldn't be in focus because no camera can have both the car and the background and everything in focus, including what is directly in front of the camera. Um, you just wouldn't see it. These would be like blurry little dots. So actually, as an example, here's a really easy way to create um, an out-of-focus, out like if you've got water on the lens of a camera, this is what it will look like. Okay, I'll just put a few dots, maybe a little drop there, like catching in the reflection of the, the rain, right? It would go sort of like that. And then I would go filter, blur, Gaussian blur. And just sort of drag it around like that. That's it. That's all you would need to do, right? Over the over the lens. You you wouldn't ever see that crystal clear. Um, the only way that could be crystal clear is if there was literally a large plane of glass directly in front of the camera, I mean, directly in front of the car about to be smashed, and it had these huge large droplets on it because it has to be in the same depth in order to be both in focus at the same time. So that's the biggest one that I would mention. So it's really, you don't have to go to all the trouble that you've went to to get that. All you got to do is that little trick. That's it. Now you've got You've got uh, rain on the on the camera lens, okay? Um, now, the next, um, actually most of it has to do with the fact that this is a rainy scene. Rain is very tricky to get right. Um, so in, in your case, what you've got going on, if, if I zoom in, it's very hard to see, but I, I think you've got raindrops across the car material there. It doesn't look so great. It looks almost furry, like you've just got like black gunk on it or something like that. So it doesn't look too great. It, it could be maybe just, I don't know, increase the amount of uh, transparency bounces perhaps. You wanna try and get like uh, like the light sort of catching in these droplets. So maybe you gotta put another light above it. You gotta try and do something because you want it to sort of light up those little droplets. Otherwise it just looks too dark. Um, and the other thing is that you've got the droplets that have ended down here. So the droplets are all fine up here and then they suddenly stop. Like maybe that part of the car down here had that never wet spray on it, you know, to stop things from getting wet. So that's what you could, maybe that's what happened, but it obviously should be across the entire car. Um, the raindrops as well, this effect, I think you could get away with less of it. I don't think you would see that much. It's a little bit heavy at the moment. And there's also no depth, like you haven't got more rain the further it goes back. Um, I, I like that you've done that for the mountains though, over there, they're a little bit, you've got that uh, atmospheric fall off, which is very important. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think you should see more raindrops the further back, but at the moment it looks sort of 2D splashed on the front there. Um, the other thing is, is that you want to try and make this car look as though it's, you, it's got motion, like it's a dynamic shot. And the way you're going to do that is by animating the car, like for just one or two frames and then turning on motion blur. And then you would actually see this back part of the car like blurry, right? Like it's skidding to the right or the left. It's right, but our left. Um, so just animate it just for like a couple of frames, whatever you need to do so that it's skidding out to the right. And then you'll get that blur on just that section there and it'll improve the scene so much. And you just check motion blur, that's it. Um, the wheel itself. So the wheel for some odd reason looks like it's got like straight lines. Like it's like a, yeah, just like a straight pattern. So, I mean, obviously if the tire is blurry, you won't be able to see too much tread, but it shouldn't look straight like that. I don't know how that happened. Maybe it was a, an error, but um, it shouldn't be like that. You should just download a tire track material. We've got one on uh, Polygon if you want it, but you just slap that on there like a bump map 
and then you just turn on motion blur and animate the tires and it will look correct. You don't have to worry about cheating. You could just make it real and then it will automatically look perfect. Um, so give that a go. Now for the actual rain itself, um, you should see it splashing off the top there. So you should have some droplets that are flying through the air. So for example, here's a great shot, right? So this is an example of what you could do to the rain in the air. So if it's sliding with so much force to the left here, some of those droplets could be like flying off, right? Like over here. And that would really add a lot to it. And the other thing is, is that if it's just bouncing off the bonnet as well, then you should see like a fine level of this, this mist, right? Across the top of the car, right? So something to note, you know, you could have that little frosty bit there that would look like it's sort of hitting the top and flying off. But yeah, just try and get some of those droplets in the middle of the air. This could be a really cool scene, just needs that extra bit of work. Get rid of the droplets and I think also improve the lighting. Like obviously it's an overcast scene, but I think you could make it look a lot better just by boosting it, you know, do some fakery like what this photographer did, add a light over here or from this direction, just experiment with different lighting setups and, um, and see how that looks. Um, and finally, the one thing I do want to mention on is that whoever designed this, this barrier for the road here should lose his job <laughs> because the, the barrier is so low that it's, it's like, it's saying like, we don't want to stop you going over the cliff. We want to flip you and then let you keep going. <laughs> like if it was that low, every car that ever hit it would just flip and then roll down the hill. <laughs> so it obviously should be higher, right? like up to there or something. Um, it'll never be that low, assuming that they, they designed it correctly. But anyways, the road texture, there's, a, you know, you could improve the road texture, but honestly, it's not gonna change that much. Um, if you improved everything else I mentioned, though, I think it should look a lot better. So have a go at that, Srihari. If you do improve it, I'd like to see your, your improved scene. So do let me know on Twitter, at Andrew P. Price. All right. Next image comes from a Jordan Whittem, who says, uh, or Whittem, Whittem. Uh, I'm a couple of months into learning 3D. It's probably the best I've made so far. I'm sure there's problems, but I'd like to know the biggest ones I can start improving on. Awesome. Jordan, if, if you are honestly a couple of months into 3D, then my friend, you are getting there because this is a really complex scene. You've done a lot. Um, I really like it. So well done. The biggest problems to mention is just that there is way too much going on and I don't know what to look at, right? I'll, I'll point out the different focal elements that there could be for this scene just based on contrast or the shape or its positioning, okay? So as a counter, right? We got this really bright and heavily textured object here. That's one. You've got a sign with words on it that seems to be for the viewer to read. That's right up there. That's two. You've got a recognizable object, which is a plain tail there. That's three. You've then got some buildings, which look like they're being drawn attention to with like these weird line shapes going across it. That's three. Uh, then you've got a person. That's four. Um, a very, very bright sun in the background there. That's another contrast element. That's five or six. And then I think you've also got different storytelling parts. You've got a sand castle down there. I don't even know what that is. That's something else. But that is just way, way too much for the viewer to try to take in when they look at this image. Honestly, the best thing you could do is less, is what they what they say kill your darlings even though i know you have spent so long on each of these elements i don't know how long you spent on that that robot or the sand castle or the the plane tail there's like you must have spent a while on this but you can't put it all in one image because the viewer can't digest that at least not with its current arrangement here um it's just yeah there's way too much so figure out what your focal element's going to be I personally think it should be this. I think that looks the coolest out of everything. And then I would just crop out the dude and that second building over there. Um, or maybe, yeah, just position this building. Take that, put him over here instead, like that. Have only one spaceship instead of two. So maybe get rid of that guy. And get rid of the plane tail because I'm not sure what the story is. It's just sort of confusing. It looks like it's a sci-fi futuristic world, but then you've got an old plane's tail sticking down there. I don't know. Um, maybe it's the story of how the robots rose up or something and they took down a plane. I don't know. I don't know what the deal is with these little 
weird slope things as well. If they're slides or something between the building, if, if they're electrical buildings, like a, you know, like a, an electric light hanging, it should be right now you've got it going like this and then up. But what you should have is what looks like that. So that the weight of it is hanging at that point there, right? <laughs> the little circle thing appeared <laughs> like it was designed to, right? Um, but yeah, so in your case, I, I would I would fix that. Anyway, let me just go back here because I just want to bring your full image back into view. Yeah, so I would do that. Just improve on those things. We could talk about the rest of it. We could talk about how I think this is actually a beach here, like the ocean, but it's so hard. I only noticed that because this is a sandcastle. And I was like, wait a minute, sandcastle. I thought we were looking out over a desert or like some green hills or something. Um, so, I mean, yeah. I think, though, if you improve those things, move that across, like the scene would just instantly feel a lot better. Move the sun as well. Remove that out of frame and get rid of this sign. Just really cut it back. So there's only one or maybe two focal elements, but one has to be stronger than the other. And at the moment, it's like they're all fighting for your attention. So watch my compositional video. It's in the link in the description, but that will help you out a lot. Uh, just to, by the way, show you some examples of good composition. This is one of my favorite um, artists, Yuri Shwedov. Uh, you can find him on ArtStation and his link's in the description as well. He's got amazing artworks, um, like ones like this, that they have a lot going on, but they're so simple and easy to read that they're just gorgeous to look at. I would love to hang them up on my wall. Um, and then this is another one I found here, Bastian Grivet, who's got some also some nice sci-fi styled images that don't have too much going on. Um, you can still read them even though there's complexity. So yeah, that would be uh, my advice for you, Jordan. Hope that helps and good luck. All right, the final image comes from an idiot called Andrew Price. <laughs> so I want to critique one of my own videos because I want to show you that I, I judge myself with the same paintbrush. I paint myself with the same brush, right? Um, yeah, so this, this image here was done, I think, a couple of years ago. I did it for a cave tutorial, um, but there are a lot of problems with it. So I'm going to point them out to you right now. Maybe you can already point them out, but um, there, are, there are a few things. The biggest one is that, yeah, I've got these toadstools here, and they just stick right into the ground, right? Like directly into the rock, and I don't think that's physically possible in nature. So you could improve it by making sure that the toadstools only appear in the crevices, like the cracks of it, um, and just make them sprout up from there. Cause then at least your eye could go, could reason with it and go like, yeah, okay. But there could be some, you know, some moisture or some greenery in those crevices. So you'll believe it, right? But just straight out of the rock, that's horrible. Um, the rock itself, there isn't enough displacement, especially in the foreground. Like the displacement looks okay, probably right up like here or around about sort of this level. But everything from there onwards, the rock looks too big, right? It's, yeah, there's there's way too much. Um, yeah, like like this this rock here looks like it should be the size of like like maybe this whole thing here should instead of it taking up two meters of the screen, its real size would be like 20 centimeters, but it's been stretched out. So it's just lacking a total amount of detail as it comes through here. If this was remade, you could use micro displacements and then it would look a whole lot better because then this section further to the front of the camera would be subdivided more than the stuff towards the back there. So it would instantly be a lot better. So yeah, there you go. Um, the other one is the crystal, like, okay, so the crystal needs to be the focal element of the scene, obviously, but that doesn't mean it just needs to be bright for no reason. It's just bright. That's all it is. It's extremely bright. Um, yeah, you, you've, you've got to have other stuff going on. And in this case, what you could do is have more refractions. So instead of it just being these big, you know, diamond shapes like that, you then, you don't have detail in the diamond. It should be lots of tiny little splints, right? Little tiny squares and triangles and stuff echoing throughout it, not just a couple of subdivisions and then that's it, right? Yeah, so you've got to have more detail to get that crystal sort of look. Um, I think I tried to fake it by adding like a frost texture on it or something. I don't know what I was doing. Um, but yeah, so that should be fixed. I think the guy in the background 
this guy, his proportions are way off. Like, look at how lanky his arms are. And they're just in like this, ooh, ooh, like ape sort of, sort of like ring like that. Just like he's just walking like, ooh, crystal, hmm? You know, uh, it, yeah, it, it, he shouldn't have those that uh, that that gaunt. Um, so yeah, I would I would probably make him bulk up a little bit as well. <laughs> Looks like he hasn't been uh, eating enough protein, so give him a little bit more thickness in the legs as well. Just sort of bulk him out a little bit better. Um, get rid of the bushes next to him as well. I don't think that adds anything to the image. We don't need to know that there's trees outside. You can just have it. It's a rocky thing. Um, but the, yeah, the trees just detract from his, because you want this area and this area to be a focal element. Um, but yeah, currently that's fighting for it. Now these, these things, what are they called? The stalactites or stalagmites? I can never remember the name. Someone told me a trick once on the last tutorial. There's like a little phrase you say, like if it's tight, it's stalactite. If it's down on the ground, it's a, I can't remember them. <laughs> I don't remember. Whatever these are. I'll call them rock icicles. You can critique me in the comments if you want. But these rock icicles, there's way too many of them, right? It's just raining icicles. They all look about the same size as well, which probably shouldn't happen. But there's way too many of them, and there doesn't appear to be any in the foreground like there should be. So, yeah, fix that up. Um, yeah, remove that, the plants. Yeah, that's basically it. So other than that, like, I mean, if, you, if we improve the texture all over it. I think that would just add a lot more detail to everything. It would just feel so much nicer. You could also add more rocks here, like different sized rocks. Doesn't have to be like a smooth cave all the way through, um, but actual different sized rocks here. Um, the toadstools in the gaps would look a, a whole lot better. Proper crystal definition in the, uh, in the crystal. Yeah, get rid of that. Improve the dude. Get rid of these things. And I think it would be improved a lot. So yeah, my, my scenes have so many things wrong with them. Like I cringe when I look at my old tutorial images because I'm like, ooh, there's so many things wrong with it. Um, but there you go. So that concludes the BG Art Critique. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope it hope you learned a couple of things perhaps. Um, if you were looking at this and you noticed other things or you disagree with some of my points, that's totally fine as well. When I watch other critique videos by photographers or art, artists. Um, I disagree with them as well. Um, it, it, a lot of it is personal preference, but I'm hoping that at least some of it sounds like it makes sense. Um, but yeah, that's it guys. Thank you to everyone who, first of all, first of all, sometimes I slip into a weird accent. Uh, first of all, to, for the people that had their work featured here, it's tough being critiqued in front of everyone. So, you know, thank you for sending it in and to everyone else that sent in your artwork. Um, yeah, thank you. I can't obviously critique them all because there's too many. I just pick the ones which are from different categories and look interesting enough. But that's it. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, please click like so others can find it. Oh, and if you want to be featured in next week's video, next, sorry, next time I want to do one of these every month, in next month's video, uh, just post your image on the Blender Guru, art, uh, Blender Guru Facebook page um, with the hashtag BG Critique, and then I'll be able to find it. Thank you, and I will see you next time.